Thanks for joining us today on The Gaze. We knew you'd be back. In this episode, we will talk about what concerns each of us, the economy. Simply put, money. Even simpler, the standard of living of each one of us. Our inquisitive and resourceful, Caroline Eshion. Hello, everybody. I hope you understand how important it is for Ukraine to win the war. But it's not enough. We mustn't lose the peace. After the war, we will build a new country. That's why it's crucial to understand our current economic situation. Let's talk about it in more detail. So, economic front. On the way to victory and Ukraine's return to everyday life, it's no less important. Russia's invasion wiped out Ukraine's years of economic growth, and now it will take a long time to return at least to the point of winter 2022. The occupation of territories, the mining of fields, and the shelling of enterprises have significantly reduced revenues to the budget of Ukraine. Instead, huge expenditures on war were added. Ukraine spends about 130 billion hryvnias on military campaigns every month, while the monthly budget income is 80 billion hryvnias. Therefore, Ukraine cannot cover its costs. Despite everything, the economy of the warring state has become more or less stable, although it is building its way with the help of international partners. We will find out how much stability costs in a country with war. The economy of Ukraine is still significantly behind the level before the beginning of the war. The economic shrank by a third after Russia's full-scale invasion last year. In January 2023, the Ministry of Economy of Ukraine estimated the drop in the country's GDP in 2022 by 30.4%. This is the worst indicator in the history of independence. In sum, this is a from more than 200 billion to 161 billion. However, according to the World Bank, this year's growth is expected to be around 3.5%, thanks to increased domestic spending and a steady flow of foreign financial support. However, economists warn that it will take years for Ukraine to return to pre-war levels and forecasts remain uncertain as fighting continues daily. But in general, after the beginning of the full-scale invasion of the Russian Federation into Ukraine, the citizens adapted to the new conditions. People are buying coffee, clothes, going to the movies and restaurants again. Their spending increases, resulting in small incremental economic growth. The International Monetary Fund predicts GDP growth this year, albeit by 2%. However, the Ministry of Economy of Ukraine is more optimistic. By the end of uh, this year and the following year, uh, GDP growth of about 5% is forecast. Almost all sectors show positive trends, notice Economy Minister Yulia Sviridenko. In particular, in agriculture, we are recording harvest growth compared to last year. In industry, production rates are gradually recovering. We have more than 10% growth in mechanical engineering, food industry and furniture production. Construction is increasing due to the continuation of restoration works. There is a revival of demand for the EOSELA mortgage program, which in turn will give an impetus to the activation of the primary real estate market. The stability of the economy is ensured, particularly by the rhythmic and predictable assistance of international partners, said the head of the Ministry of Finance of Ukraine, Sergei Marchenko. This year, partners gave Kyiv approximately 33.8 billion. Marchenko noted that the joint efforts of the Ukrainian government and foreign partners ensure full provision of all public services to the population, avoiding monetary financing. At the same time, the Minister of Finance emphasized that the uncertainty caused by the full-scale invasion of Russia persists, so external support for Ukraine is vitally necessary. Let's talk about current economic situation in Ukraine with our first guest. And the advisor to the president of Ukraine, 
Olegu Stenko is in touch with us. Thank you very much for taking the time to have this conversation. My pleasure. Mm. My first question. Ukrainian economic situation is challenging enough. How difficult it is on a scale of one to five, the higher the score, the worse the situation. I would say that, yes, uh, indeed, the situation is quite challenging, but if you ask me to score it, I would probably say that it's on the level of two and a half, somewhere between these numbers. And let me give you uh, my uh, understanding of why I am judging uh, with this kind of trade. Uh, first of all, I would say that, yes, uh, there was a significant um, push for Ukrainian economy uh, in 2022, right after the invasion started. Uh, that year, the Ukrainian economy fell down by more than 25 percent, which is obviously a huge number. Uh, when you have that kind of uh, decline in the country's GDP, you have to expect that it's going to be in parallel the decline in budget revenues. And this is what we uh, started to observe from the very beginning of this mm. work. Why it happened? It happened not because of the problems with economic policy or any decisions uh, uh, made by the government. It's actually happened because Russians uh, were attacking our uh, infrastructure, because Russians were attacking our companies, our enterprises, and eventually uh, part of our economy uh, was not able to operate in a normal regime, if I may say. So that's why we absorb those kind of uh, issues. However, if it's a question whether it's going to be changed, yes, it's going to be changed for sure. Mm. So your uh, assess, uh, your assess, sorry, your assess is quite pretty good, I think. It's it's uh, better than one, but far from five. But what shall we do? Okay, my next, my, my next question. Which economic sectors have suffered the most after the full-scale Russian invasion? What do you think? I would say that obviously the whole economy suffered a lot. However, if uh, we are talking about particular sectors in our economy, I would say that probably the most uh, difficult hit uh, was done for uh, Ukrainian agri -stack. and uh, because of several reasons. Uh, first of all, uh, Ukrainian agri sector when, when the war started, when the invasion started, so it was uh, already the end of February. Uh, but according to all, all standards we have, we have to start our storing campaign in our fields not later than the third week, even second week uh, of uh, March. And then it should be completed, you know, finally completed uh, till the third week of uh, April. So when the invasion started, our farmers were not able to work in a normal way. Uh, and uh, also true that Russians uh, started to occupy some significant portion uh, of our territory, especially when we think in terms of south of the country. So basically farmers were not able to work, and farmers are an important source of our, uh, not only budget revenues, but also foreign exchange we are receiving in the country. Mm -hmm. So from this point of view, I thought that they were the first one who actually received uh, this heat from Russian, uh, from Russian troops, the risk. However, uh, then uh, it, 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 it was not limited by uh, Ukrainian agro sector because then the effect was spread over all over the uh, economy, and then obviously uh, machinery, uh, mach uh, ma 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 machinery, our industrial enterprises were also hit, and also true that uh, construction, logistics, everything was under attack of Russians, uh, but. Uh, you know, one more time, when you experience 25% decline in your economy, and this is the level which we experienced in 2022, then it's so obviously the heat was huge and it was not limited by one or two sectors. It was spread over all over the economy. So, 
Winter is just around the corner, and how ready is our energy sector for it? Uh, look, uh, our energy sector is definitely uh, under attack of uh, Russia. And it's true that we already uh, lived through uh, those difficult times in 2022 uh, and also this year. Russians already started to attack. Even this season, they already started to attack uh, our electrical infrastructure. Uh, I would say that uh, uh, our, uh, our energy companies did whatever was possible in order to uh, renew, or I'm not saying rebuild, but renew uh, the capacity of our uh, energy infrastructure. However, whether it's, it's enough or not, no, definitely it's not enough. Uh, definitely much more sh uh, should be done. And uh, here we are coming to the issue of uh, the price tag. And the price tag actually uh, is a huge one. Uh, look, uh, all, overall, uh, the damage which was done by uh, Russians uh, in, our, uh, in our country, uh, in, in financial terms, here we are talking about the level of 750 uh, billion US dollars. If you add there, so-called indirect costs, then the price tag might be as high as one trillion US dollars. Uh, however, um, you know, when the government is uh, talking now and discussing all issues related to the building of our economy, they are talking about two parallel tracks. The first track is so-called fast track recovery of the trade. The second track is, you know, just, just a regular recovery. But for the fast track recovery here, uh, Prime Minister and the Cabinet are talking about uh, a price tag between 15 to 20 uh, uh, billion US dollars. In 15 to 20 billion US dollars, you know, compared with 750 billion US dollars okay. overall price tag, it's a kind of a minor share. However, here we are talking about uh, not, you know, full reconstruction and renovation but uh, uh, the price which should be paid in order to keep this system, energy system of the country operation. So mm -hmm. the, but even, even when it's 15, between 15 to 20 billion US dollars for the fast track recovery, I would probably argue that the most significant share in here is exactly the price uh, or the cost uh, for rebuilding or repairing uh, our energy. Mm. Mr. Senka, it's no secret that Ukraine had a huge legacy of post-Soviet infrastructure. There is no point in restoring it in the 21st century. What have we said goodbye to forever? Uh, well, this is a very good point, uh, because when we are uh, discussing the issue of rebuilding of the Ukrainian economy, I, I would probably say uh, two, in my view, important things. The first one is that everything should be compensated uh, by Russian aggress. This is for sure. They did this damage and they have to compensate. And when we are saying that it should be compensated by Russians, it means that they have to pay for that. And then uh, those frozen assets of Russia, which are currently frozen, should be not only frozen, but should be transferred to Ukraine for the purpose of rebuilding the country. And here we are also, uh, and then the second issue, of course, you know, one thing is to find the money which you are needed in order to rebuild the country, but the second equally important issue is how you are going to use this money, for which projects this money are going to be used. Yeah. And in my view, you are absolutely right. Should be rebuilt and should be renewed in, uh, you know, in full scale the old Soviet infrastructure, we have to build a new one. Also, keep in mind that uh, after you uh, declined last year or by more than 25%, and then some uh, small but still grows this year, which is expected to be for our economy on a level of 4%, and uh, uh, the economy grows next year. Uh, on a level of around 5%, we'll still 
keep us below the level of pre-invasion, below the pre-invasion level, which means that we have to ensure a significant and much faster um, rate of growth for the country in order to come back uh, to the uh, pre-invasion level. And then, if we are discussing this issue, then we are also discussing the issues related to uh, how we are going uh, to proceed. In which sectors, uh, which sectors should be renewed, and in which format it should be renewed? Uh, do we really need to rebuild some companies which were built during the Soviet time, or we have to build the brand new companies which are going to be based on new technologies, on new machinery, on new know-how? And I think that uh, do, we, do we need, uh, do we need uh, to continue uh, our orientation on uh, fossil fuel or we have to think in terms of green technology, uh, in terms of substitution of traditional uh, energy sources? And I think the answer is very clear. Uh, the answer is that, yes, we have to rebuild, but we have to rebuild uh, on a new platform, completely on a new scale. Yeah. We have to ensure... <laughs> that the country is able to reach that kind of economic growth, which will bring us in almost immediately back to the level of uh, pre-invasion. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, uh, Mr. Istenka, one, one moment. Uh, this, uh, this, uh, your words just ticks me in my head. Uh, you mentioned that we have to reach the level, pre-war level, yeah? The growth of economy. And how many years will it take us to get to this level? How many years? Uh, look, uh, th this is a very valuable point. Uh, but uh, look, uh, uh, in 2021, uh, we reached uh, the highest level uh, of, uh, of, our, uh, of our GDP uh, in our modern economic history. And that level used to be almost 200 billion U.S. dollars, 200 billion U.S. dollars. The economic, uh, the uh, GDP, GDP this year is expected to be on a level of roughly around 150 billion U.S. dollars. So if you are talking about these dollar terms, then probably a couple of years, let's say two, three years, will be enough to come back to the, uh, the previous uh, level, to the pre-war uh, level. However, you know, we just have an orientation on um, uh, on uh, absolute numbers. However, what we need to do, we need to ensure that the economy is growing uh, at a much faster level. And also keep in mind mm -hmm. that, uh, you know, when wow. before the war, uh, people and experts were discussing that the Ukrainian economy should grow at a level of 5%. And people were talking about this 5% of annual economic growth because this is exactly the number which is needed for the country in order uh, to be able to fight with the poverty. And this, is, uh, this number uh, was, uh, in this sense, uh, kind of consensus for, for, for the world and for Ukraine uh, as well. However, uh, now when you have, when we have uh, to jump, when we have, because definitely, you know, uh, when you are on a track to you, when you are after the war, uh, when, uh, you know, uh, you have uh, so many damages done by aggressive in your economy, so definitely you have to go at a much faster place, uh, pay, uh, pace. When we are talking about the needed uh, rate of economic growth for Ukraine after the war, I would say probably that it should be 10% plus. And then if you have 10% plus economic growth, then during two, three years, you will be able to get back uh, to the previous pre-war uh, pre level. And then definitely what is needed, uh, you have to match the level uh, in at least in uh, Eastern Europe since uh, the country is moving forward uh, to EU membership. And then this is a more ambitious, uh, of course, uh, task. However, it's not, uh, it, it's not something we are not able to do. We, we can do this and this is for sure. So, and for that, uh, I would probably argue we will be needed somewhere close to 10 years. Thank you very much for being with us. Thank you for this conversation. Advisor to the president of Ukraine, Oleg Ustenko, thank you very much for this conversation. Watch this. 
Let's continue our topic. So, Ukraine received the ninth tranche of macrofinancial aid for 1.5 billion euros from the European Union, announced Prime Minister Denis Shmigal. According to him, EU budget support for Ukraine in 2023 has already reached 15 billion euros. As part of the programme, two more tranches are expected by the end of 2023. The Minister of Finance noticed that macrofinancial assistance is provided on unprecedented preferential terms and is aimed at financing priority expenditures of the state budget of Ukraine. The loan repayment period is 35 years, and the EU, instead of Ukraine, will compensate interest and other payments for servicing the loan. In the next four years, the European Union will provide 50 billion euros in aid to Ukraine, European Commission President Ursula von der Leyen said during a visit to the White House. While meeting with US President Joe Biden, von der Leyen emphasized that the European Union will continue to assist Ukraine and the events in the Middle East will not distract Brussels from this. We have already provided almost $90 billion in aid to Ukraine. This includes financial support for the Ukrainian economy, military equipment, humanitarian aid and support for 4 million refugees. I would also like to add that Ukraine is about to receive a written evaluation of the implementation of the recommendations of the European Commission for the start of negotiation on joining the European Union. As the Speaker of the Verkhovna Rada, Ruslan Stefanchuk, said, the Ukrainian Parliament fulfilled all the requirements of the European Commission in the context of European integration legislation. So let's talk about this with a well-versed person in this topic. Timofey Milovanov. Watch this. With me in the studio, Timofey Milovanov, president of Kiev School of Economics, advisor to the head of, of the president's office, minister of economic development, head of the supervisory board of Ukraine Obron Prom State Concern. My first question is Please. how do you assess? the general state of the economic situation in Ukraine in a year and a half after the full-scale invasion uh, in Ukraine. Uh, can we say that there is a trend towards its improvement? Or maybe we're still very dependent on the help of our partners? Both are correct. Um, the economy contracted about 30% GDP terms, real GDP terms. Um, by the end of 2022. So in the first uh -huh. year of the full-scale invasion, one third of the economy is gone. Uh, but we expect about maybe 5%, there are different forecasts, but basically we expect economic growth this year and we expect economic growth uh, next year um, in the single digits, uh, which is a sign that the economy is adjusting and is able to improve over time. But it is true that without international support, without the support of the allies, the Ukrainian economy uh, would be in a very difficult state. Uh, among well-known demand from our financial partners, first of all, is the fight against corruption, number one. Number two, strengthening the democracy in, in Ukraine. And Ukraine, especially recently, has demonstrated uh, pretty much good situation with it. Success even in such, in these areas. Will this affect the level of our cooperation with uh, our allies, uh, our partners? Well, so it's complex because partners and allies, they all have different views and opinions and there's internal dynamics uh, within them. Even if we separate IFIs, international financial institutions, well, you know, they have their own donors and that's sovereign countries and they have their own views. There are some disagreements and uh, some agreements among them. Oh. So it's, it's actually not a very simple question. I mean, of course, it's simple to say corruption reforms democracy, but when it comes to specifics and timing, uh, there are a lot of disagreements. Um, conditionality will be there. Conditionality means that money in exchange, uh, not just uh, um, as a support, but in exchange for uh, certain changes in legislations, more alignment with the EU, first of all, 
Uh, a part of this, of course, a, a threat throughout is uh, anti-corruption efforts. Uh, but again, that, that needs to be done much more specific. We, we are talking about accountability, transparency, best practices. Mm. So uh, the, amount, the amounts of assistance is huge. Sometimes it uh, sounds like scary even. Uh, does our government have a, an understanding how to pay this money back? So some of it is grants, some of it is loans. Um, in terms of grants, a lot of support some, uh, comes in kind. For mm. example, it could be actually weapons and ammunition. Or um, let's say in the most recent appropriation request by the Biden administration, a lot of funding is going directly back to Pentagon or to the industry. Uh, mm. So only much smaller amounts than we see in the news uh, go directly to Ukrainian support and even less to the economic support. There's more economic support coming from the EU partners and especially from the Ukraine facility program. That's $50 billion over the course of several years until 2027. Uh, most of it is loans. Um, from the EU, Are typically there any it's, guarantee we will get this money? <laughs> it's likely we're going to get this money. Mm -hmm. um, the facility itself is, is essentially approved. Uh, the question is to create budget or finance it. And for that, we need... Um, agreement of all the EU countries. Um, well, there are ways to bypass that, by the way, but uh, Brussels will try not to do it. Uh, but we have seen that there are political issues. For example, Hungary from time to time uh, tries to leverage its ability to put a veto mm. power on disbursing the aid to Ukraine. Maybe my next question sounds a little bit naive, but let me ask you, why don't we negotiate to write off at least some of that, like other countries did. Uh, the war is a sufficient condition for this. So a lot of funding is um, very, very long term and is essentially 0%, definitely under inflation. So there is there's no need to discuss um, the issue of repayment right now. Um, in 10, but it's 20, better 30, not to pay at all. <laughs> well, you know, I don't know. I, I, I think that's, that's bad to uh, start arguing that we're going to, you know, uh, not pay because we want to build a reputation of responsible partner uh, for the financial markets. Uh, but who will pay? Our next generation will pay all this debt. Again, I think the yes. fact of this money is it has... Uh, negative real interest rates because inflation is higher than the interest rates we have to pay. So it's like we're being paid. Um, so it's convenient for us to get this money even if, even if it is really big money. Yeah, so, so we need this money for defense, we need yes, this money definitely. for economy. Uh, sure. But if we are serious about restructuring of the debt and writing mm. off some of it, will that happen? Well, uh, it might or might not. It's likely to happen uh, depending on how long the war uh, goes on and how knows, difficult yes, uh, the economy situation is and also how much money is needed for defense. Um, mm -hmm. And restructuring happens, countries do that, especially in tough situations. In this case, what's very clear is that um, it is not a fault of Ukraine. It's a very morally clear situation and it's a very economically clear situation. Um, but... Um, you are correct uh, that it would be better for Ukraine and for the world um, if this were grants. Might mm. not be obvious, but there's a political component to that. This discussion about restructuring, writing off, interest right. rates, the total yeah. debt will always take a political um, color to it, you know. It's always yeah, about once the war is colors. over. And so there were, that provides opportunities for populist and regre uh, regressionary forces to try to gain ground, arguing exactly that we shouldn't pay uh, the West back or the West is trying to, you know, to, to, to leverage us too much or something else. So with these discussions have to be uh, managed carefully because even before the war, we have seen that narratives and Russia exploited some of them and some populists have exploited some. Thus, what we need is always coincide with uh, uh, what our uh, partners need in there are, Ukraine. There are disagreements, of course, and... Uh, for example, Ukraine is, you know, Ukraine carries the entire cost of the war. 
whereas our partners uh, are carrying financial, but not necessarily human, you know, not necessarily, for sure not, you know, citizens of uh, Europe, uh, unless they volunteer in Ukraine, and that's their own decision, but citizens as the members of the countries, they don't participate, they're not drafted, they don't die, their infrastructure is not being uh, killed, their children uh, is not being destroyed, their children are not being um, uh, moved to Russia and, uh, uh, you know, essentially Russified. That's not happening. So we have a much stronger incentive for all of this to end because we're fighting for our culture and we want to end the war and the um, and uh, uh, hostilities against us and uh, the murder of our people and genocide against our people as soon as possible. But that also creates a very specific uh, uh, conflict or tension. Because for us, it's about preserving our culture. Oh. And so when we say the war should end, it should end on those terms which will protect us and prevent from the continuation or, or, or another war in the future, several years from now. And it will protect, um, and we will get back those territories, but the language about which I occupy, but the language of territories is, is, <coughs> is unfortunate in my view. Because we're, we're actually going to talk about people who are being tortured, raped, murdered right now in occupied territories. So we want to bring our people to save them from Russia and pr protect our culture. Mm -hmm. <coughs> so, um... I want to talk with you about investments. Uh, all the assistance is very important, but private investors maybe. Why not? It's very important for, for the Ukraine. And what should be done first so that investors can move from intention, intention to invest in Ukraine to real action? And can we say that investments in Ukraine, this is the additional safety factor for the Ukraine. So what we have seen is that, I mean, at the Kiev School of Economics as a mm. research institution, what we have seen is that investment is happening in one specific sector. This is military tech, where the innovation from drones, from UAV, aerial drones, vehicles, but to many other drones, that's happening. Uh, but also in all other defense-related areas. That is happening uh, from large-scale investments and joint ventures to startup ecosystems and such. Mm -hmm. We also have seen that in some of the logistics operations and some of the infrastructure, there's resilience, maintenance, uh, and investment in some of the new projects or some of the projects which maintain what has been destroyed or rebuild what has been destroyed. There's also some in construction, uh, mm -hmm. especially IDP housing, uh, rebuilding clinics, and so on. Mm -hmm. um, who is investing? Uh, it tends to be uh, companies which have already had experience with Ukraine because they have people on the ground. They understand that the risks, uh, you know, might be not as high as it might look from outside. Whereas it's very difficult for new companies which have not had a foot in, in the door in Ukraine previously to come in. So we have a little bit of polarization. You know, let's say American companies which have been present in Ukraine, they continue to invest, and some of them are even growing. It's not true for everyone, but uh, it's a pattern. Whereas companies which have not been in Ukraine, they are not investing, and it's likely that they will wait until the war is over. Mm -hmm. As you mentioned, military sector. Let me quote uh, from the, the New York Times. It was written recently. Military production drives the economy. But in regular times, there would, be, would not be such a demand for this particular production. But it doesn't happen that today we develop this direction, but uh, tomorrow we stop it. it, it well, so, so, so there are two it, effects like uh, which are direct for economy. One, we will be able to export some of these weapons and munitions and technologies outside of country. Not all of them, because some of them will be strategic and there are actually restrictions on what is tradable and what is not tra tradable. Mm. But many of those will, will be uh, possible to export. And before the war, uh, before the full-scale invasion, Ukraine ex uh, you know, provided weapons and maintenance of weapons uh, outside of Ukraine. So that's, that's an export revenue. We mm. are known as a country for grain and for IT. Some people say grain and brain. Uh, but now it will also be mill tech. So it will be a third major. I mean, we have other, we, we have other uh, industries, but uh, these are often the industries in the news. Mm -hmm. um, the second aspect is that there are technological spillovers uh, into civilian sector. For example, uh, you know, everyone has seen drones by now, which can uh, identify a person, an enemy, or a tank, 
um, and drop a grenade or some kind of munition mm. on them. And today it, it might even be possible to put a picture of an object or even a person, an AI will try to find it and target it precisely. Now, uh -huh. uh, of course, you can try to deliver coffee with that. Uh -huh. So instead of uh, dropping munitions, you can, uh, you know, you can have a customer. There could be a profile on the customer, could be location, and a coffee shop can deliver coffee with uh, with AI drone, the powered drone. But uh -huh. they also can do more things. Uh, you can do life-saving operations. That there would be drones which will deliver and administer uh, life uh, life critical medication to people who are experiencing an attack, for example. And they can do it themselves. So there'll be spillovers. This idea of identifying, uh, ident identifying the target and delivering the payload uh, during the war, it's of course a military payload, but you can deliver products and services and you can administer them um, in civil uh, use. So I think uh, that's gonna be a booming market. Yeah, uh, does it mean that in, in, in the future Ukraine will become a country with a well-developed military, military industrial complex? I think so. Uh, it's, uh, in my because view, it's some inevitable. Some people say, think that it's, you know, when it's war, it's okay in a war condition, but uh, in the uh, peaceful time. It's but the threat war. will not disappear. So the problem with Russia is that Russia is mm -hmm. such a large country and such a brutal country culturally in so many areas that uh, it necessitates um, a kind of management or governance which is also brutal and authoritarian. Uh, so Russia will stay there and Russia will be a threat as long as it stays imperialistic and it will stay imperialistic for quite a while. It will take decades to, for the culture to for sort of reckoning, self-reflection, mm. to change the attitudes of people. So it's not just Putin, it's tens of thousands of people uh, pressing buttons to send missiles to kill civilians and it, m tens of millions of people cheering behind that. So mm -hmm. it's not so easy to say that tomorrow, after the war is over, the threat will disappear. No, the threat will not. Unfortunately, the threat will also be there for Baltic countries, for Poland, for Central and Eastern European countries, and elsewhere in, in the world, from, C from Syria to Libya to you name it. So Russia you know, has been doing uh, conflicts throughout the world, and that's how they run their foreign policy in Africa, through Wagner, for example. Um, even in Latin American, they influence, uh, sometimes through cyber warfare, even in the US. So things are there, they will stay there, and uh, military defense complex will be needed in Ukraine because that's where the experience is, that's where the people are, who uh, have the knowledge needed to continue to maintain defense against Russia. And mm -hmm. we think about defense more generally, it's not just brick and mortar, it's not physical necessarily, weapons, it's also cyber, it's uh, propaganda, anti-propaganda, it's yeah. communications, it's uh, sabotage, it's uh, undermining political processes, all that is at play. Mm -hmm. uh, you just mentioned two countries, at least two countries, uh, Czech Republic and Poland, and uh, uh, this position, this attitude to, towards U Ukraine, it's controversial. Uh, can we uh, rely on these uh, countries, these governments? <laughs> Absolutely. Um, apologies. It's not uh, easy to talk to no. talk about it, these countries because we all remember the uh, absolutely fresh election in each of these countries, and uh, this position about Ukraine supports Ukraine is really controversial. So, so in Slovakia, the, there is a Robert Fico government, uh, mm -hmm. which is openly uh, anti-Ukrainian. Absolutely denied. Um, right? And, and then in Poland, uh, we have had a friction recently, which is a political election-driven friction, but it looks like the government will be formed by, uh, by the opposition by the coalition of the opposition parties, and it will be a pro-European um, pro government. So this is good because if we're going to talk about the four countries in, in default, Hungary, Slovakia, uh, Czech Republic, and Poland, now two of them are openly pro-European, and two of them, with Fico and Orban, are pushing, you can say, pro-Russian agenda. Mm -hmm. um, and... Um, there will be a balance. I think uh, the new Polish government will be able to moderate that. So I think this is, this is good news. And that tells us that democracy is alive and well, and we have to give it a chance, but we have to protect it. Democracy should not be taken for granted. It has to be defended. It has to be defended. Um, uh, my next question is about, this is a wide discussion uh, in Ukraine, about the modest quotas for the presence of Ukrainian business in, Euro in European markets. Uh, it can uh, 
this situation, this situation will be changed in the future. Can European Union just increase the quotas for the Ukrainian business? In principle, it can. Uh, we, there is an association agreement. There is WTO um, rules, um, and you you might have seen uh, in the news that Ukraine tried to sue um, Poland for not following the EU Commission decision on removing uh, restrictions and ban on imports uh, of agricultural products from mm -hmm. Ukraine, um, and that caused uh, political. Um, crisis actually in the relationship between Poland and uh, Ukraine so, uh, with the previous government. So we have to be careful. We have to balance. Ukraine has to balance um, and respect in some ways, uh, in many ways, has to respect the needs, political needs of mm. other countries, of neighbors. But at the same time, Ukraine has to argue and protect its own sovereign interests. So mm. the friction will be there. And so one way to overcome this friction is uh, through the Brussels uh, pol politics. Brussels can offer and is trying to That's offer right. uh, benefits and perks and uh, political uh, you know, arguments to the countries which are blocking um, so that um, in All Ukraine... All decisions in Brussels, it seems like it's not very important for Poland, for example. Well, yes and no. I think uh, Brussels has a lot of influence legally, uh, t technically, uh, through bureaucratic procedures and also through funding. And mm. as long as Poland is a part of EU, yes, uh, it will be able to leverage some of the opposition politically uh, to EU, but uh, it is limited. And mm. it's true for Hungary as well. So and that's a new, not a new problem. And Poland was entering the EU. Um, some other Central and Western European countries were uh, resisting and protecting their own, you know, having protectionist policies. But I think there is a better way. You can try to overcome it by creating, uh, let's say, a uh, trans-border infrastructure fund, which invests both in infrastructure in Ukraine and in Poland, so mm -hmm. that the farmers on both sides of the border benefit from this. And mm -hmm. if you bundle these issues, if you, if you try to avoid you know, putting farmers in Ukraine and farmers in Poland head to head, and that's exactly, by the way, what Russia wants and amplifies, um, instead trying to move from zero-sum conflict into win-win scenario, then I think there is a way forward. But mm -hmm. uh, politicians at this point are not used to thinking that way. Uh, there is another topic uh, which is very essential, uh, I think. Uh, so, in Ukraine, this is an opinion that the economic profile which existed before the, the war, before the full-scale invasion, should be completely different. And this is not a secret that Ukraine had a huge legacy of post-Soviet infrastructure, which is destroyed or damaged because of, due to the war. Yes, and this is a, um, uh, no need to restore it in 21st uh, century. What have we say goodbye to forever? What do you think? So uh, specifically on energy infrastructure, it is true mm. that a lot of infrastructure has been destroyed, but it's also true that the remaining infrastructure is running uh, often the frequencies, which are different from European frequencies. Uh, that's not true for the entire system because we're running at the consumer level, we are running the same frequencies as, uh, and standards as are run in Europe. Uh, but at the level of transmission and generation, sometimes things are very different. So it's mm. not that easy of the process. It's not that you completely destroy the entire energy infrastructure and you are building it from scratch. No, it remains. And so it's much more complicated than that. But it is true that there is a lot of transition happening right now. Uh, what do you think? How many, how many years, years will it take uh, for Ukraine to, to, to reach the level of economic growth as it was before the... Uh, full-scale invasion. So let's say if the, war, if the war stops at the end of this year completely, then I think we can... Are you believe in this? Well, so that depends. Uh, and uh, that's a separate, uh, separate conversation. Discussion, yeah, uh, conversation. I think it's going to be longer. So, so on the war, I think most people... So I think on the war, um, it will be over one day. But it will be over not tomorrow. And I think most people... Um, either fall you know, into despair when they think that they, it will never be over, or they hope it will be over tomorrow and then they're disappointed. That's not going to be the case. Everything ends. Nazism ended. People who were in Nazi camps, many of them, not all, but many of them survived. So everything at some point ends. 
And not everyone will survive, but many will. So the war will be over. Our awful, horrible experience today, Russian attempt to destroy our culture and our sovereignty and our nation will cease at some point. That is not possible. But of course, many people will die and many people will torture. So, but you know, you, you, like we got distracted on this and I forgot the question. I think the question was about economy. Yes, so, so <laughs> if, all if, our questions about economy. Yeah, so actually. if let's say the war ends at the end of this year and so we can start growing from uh, 2024, I think we need about three years maybe to come back to the pre uh, maybe less, maybe two years to, to 2022 level or the beginning of 22 pre-war level. Mm -hmm. uh, and then we can grow maybe single, high single or low uh, double digits, meaning seven, 10, something percent. Uh, but it requires uh, certain aspects of uh, economy to change. Okay, let's talk about, about the future because future. everybody wants to look okay. to the future yeah to see the future and if i ask you what kind of future do you see for ukraine in 10 and 15 and 20 years will it be the country with agriculture country or like you said uh grain and brain country or with well uh, well developed military uh, productions so people think that agriculture agriculture is low tech that's not the case agriculture actually is a high tech uh, industry. Mm. Uh, a lot of drone technology that Ukraine deploys is coming from spillovers from agriculture. Mm -hmm. So in the future, agriculture will be there. There probably will be much more processing. That's one of the industries which are growing right now. Processing is growing. Processing of uh, food, food processing mm -hmm. in particular. Um, IT will be there, high, you know, creative services will be there, but Miltech will be there and spillovers from that. So I think the manufacturing has a very bright future here. Uh, and um, also uh, defense technologies, uh, as well as uh, anything related to food. Um, but all that is predicated on A, the end of the war, and B, support, and C, people coming back to Ukraine, so refugees and IDPs. Then on rebuilding, we have to rebuild the country. People have to have housing to live, schools uh, for their children to go, um, infrastructure to get food, you know, to drink safe water, to to be protected, to feel, you know, we have we'll have to have uh, air defense. I like your optimist about, especially when we are talking about the opportunity, but the possibility for Ukraine to get the people back to to our country. Oh, I to, think to, there to are Ukraine. The, the, but this is the issue. No, this no, I think there are essentially not two, e two not outcomes. Not easy to do that. Well, uh, yes and no. I, I think there are essentially two outcomes. One is, and both of them are self-fulfilling and can happen. One is Ukraine is buzzing and booming with, uh, after the war. You know, we have protected our country. We have defended. We have stopped Russia. Mm. Uh, and we, we are the victors. And we are rebuilding our country. Now let's get to work on the economy side, you know. Mm. We are done with military. Okay, we continue to protect our perimeter, but let's but now we, get... We just can't stop uh, military and uh, to switch on the peaceful lifestyle. But yes, you, you, you it, will it have... So like the, 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 Ukra I, it, from my will, perspective. Ukraine will stay militarized for a long time. Yeah. But there will be a sense of renaissance and recovery and rebuilding. And it will be simultaneously with Ukraine staying militarized. In fact, it complements each other. Um, and if that's happened, people, uh, that's going to happen, people will come back. Because people, is. yeah, I, I think people will come back. If there are jobs, if there are things to do, if there is a sense but of success. But it depends on the time when, uh, which people uh, spend abroad, being abroad. You know, uh, people, I've spent 15 uh, years uh, abroad uh, and yeah, I've come children back. Is now is go, go to schools. That all, uh, that all is important. Some people will come back, some will not. But fundamentally, you know, look at Israel. You know, so many people who have oh. never been in Israel came to Israel over the years. So, you know, uh, there are ways uh, and migration policies will be important for Ukraine. But there's also a different outcome where economy is depressed and it doesn't feel like, you know, Ukraine is rebuilding. And if this is the case, many people will choose to stay abroad. Uh, maybe they will not like it, but they would want a better future for their kids. And they would be willing to do that, you know, to, to, 
to sacrifice their present. So I think it is important for us that recovery happens fast and in a coordinated uh, manner, and we don't you know, spread it over years. You know? We have to send a very clear signal to everyone in the world that Ukraine is strong, Ukraine is rebuilding, Please come back. There are jobs for you. There are places to live. There jobs is culture. Jobs for you. Yeah, jobs, jobs are important. It's very important. Well, jobs, uh, social protection, pensions, everything is important. Everything. But uh, jobs, of course, are going to be the driver. Uh, yeah, 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 definitely. And when we talk about the future, as we uh, started to talk about this, uh, we mean it will set, certainly environmentally sustainable, it's very fashion uh, was, and socially responsible, because this is what the global trends look, looks like and what strategic steps has already been done in this path, on this path. Well, people want to have a, a, you know, a right to drink clean water and we need to sustain the environment for that. We humans shouldn't kill our planet. But sometimes I wonder if with a neighbor like Russia, the right for a proper air defense is more important than the right for sustainable environment. So, you know, as long as we have the war here, as long as we have aggressive Russia in the region, mm. we will have difficult time compromising internationally on climate change, agreeing to move forward to resolve issues like environment, or say inequality, global inequality, or poverty. Look what Russia has been doing. Kahovka Dam destroyed. That's an ecological disaster. But, you know, at every time they send a missile or, or fire a, an artillery shell, that poisons the environment. So, yes, it would be great to have a sustainable environment in Ukraine post-war. Um, and uh, we have to strive to achieve that. And that's why we mm. need to stop the war faster. And that's why Russia is actually damaging the environment. So, you know, we, at the Kiev School of Economics, it's we have done... never-ending process. <laughs> well, yes, true. Yes. So, so we have done an estimate of how much this war has done to environment. The damage. Uh, damage mm -hmm. to environment. And it's equivalent to your average European nation annual destruction of the environment through CO2 and other pollutions. So, you know, it's kind of, you take a good economy like Germany or Netherlands and you mm. double its damage and that's what the war has done in one year. In two years it has done double. So the war is actually extremely harmful environmentally, not only locally for the land in Ukraine, not, but yeah, also globally for, for the yeah, climate globally, change yeah. too, because it mm. adds to the environmental pollution it adds to climate change. I mean, the, of course, it's not the biggest point of this war, but you see how widespread the damage from the war is? So yes, we have to protect our environment and we have to strive, but in order to be able to talk seriously, not just talk about it in conferences and mm -hmm. pass great resolutions, you know, and uh, feel good about this, but actually to get things done, we have to check and constrain countries like Russia so they don't start wars. You think that this is our uh, the world. ability? No, it's not. It's not. Listen. Ukraine can stop and can has stop. stopped Russia, but yeah. it's the world responsibility, responsibility yeah. to protect sure. the planet. And uh, if we're talking about the environment, wars mm -hmm. are damaging the environment significantly. Mm. And my last question, I think, is that people very often talk about that this war or conflict uh, so far conflict uh, between Israel and Palestine can distract our partners from the assistance to Ukraine? Attention is, is scarce attention. resource. Um, resource. You know, how much time you have a day, it's 24, you know, even if you don't sleep, and you can only process that much information per minute. Um, <laughs> that's the reality, you know, if things yeah. are happening, if I look at new uh, headlines today, they're mostly about Gaza. You know, I'm going to open right now, you know, my uh, iPhone and I'm going to look at the, um, at the news headlines. Mm -hmm. And I'm the first one, police search, that's the US, Israeli military, Israel, 51 absolutely fascinating photos, something, evidence. And Ukraine. Uh, no Ukraine. No, no Ukraine. No uh, Ukraine. Mike Johnson, the new house speaker, Israel, Gaza, no Ukraine in no this, Ukraine. Uh, you know, five weeks this ago, it was yeah. at least two headlines in my 
uh, Apple news would be about Ukraine. So it is happening in real time. And it matters for donors. Uh, donors are pulling out money and diverting them to Israel and Gaza uh, causes, um, or at least limiting the budgets. And it's up to us to be sustainable militarily as well. We have to remember that, that there will be moments where we'll get more support and there will be moments where we'll have less support. And we have to work really, really hard to maintain the support. And for there are it depends, for, uh, first of all, from our government, for people. <laughs> it's always people, in my view. Uh, in my view, it's always our authority. Yeah, well, then you deny the agency to, to the people. I think, you know, uh, it's my job to protect the country. I, I am not good at fighting in the trench, absolutely. Mm. Um, but I'm good at doing what I can. It's raising money and teaching people and doing analytics. And that's what I've been doing since the beginning of the war. So everyone has to do their job to protect the country. We cannot rely on the authority. Authorities can get in the way or they can help. And we are lucky and fortunate to have leadership. Zelensky is a historic figure and he has managed to convey to the world what is actually happening here. I know locally uh, a lot of politicians and people will disagree with me and will think that I'm biased or something. But you know, history will be a judge. Mm. Zelensky will be in history books. But that's not enough. Zelensky alone or people around Zelensky cannot change the outcome of history. He can lead the change. But it takes the people, it takes the nation to stop Russia, to build our own country, and to form ourselves a democracy. Yeah. Thank you very much for this uh, insightful conversation, Mr. Milovanov. Thank you. Thank you very much. Watch this. In addition to the European Union, the Treasury of Ukraine is filled with the support of the USA, the IMF, Canada, Japan, and other countries of the European Union. Here are more details in the numbers. Ukrainians themselves sent $12 billion to the Treasury by buying OVDP. Almost $11 billion was provided by the USA. The IMF directed $3.5 billion. Canada, $1 billion, $700 million. Almost $1.5 billion was provided by Japan. Great Britain helped by providing almost $600 million and the World Bank $579 million. Less than $100 million was provided by the governments of other European countries such as Spain, Germany, Finland, Ireland, Switzerland, Belgium, Iceland and Estonia. In 2024, as in the current year, Ukraine will need financial support from partners in approximately 42 billion US dollars, Prime Minister Denis Shmigal said. He noted that this is significant, but it includes only critically needed budget expenditures. As for specific sources for income, the head of the government said that Ukraine expects to receive 18 billion from the European Union, about 12 billion from the United States, and funds under multi-year programs from Japan and Norway for 5.5 billion dollars and 7.5 billion dollars. According to the Prime Minister, Ukraine will be able to extract some of them next year. Schmigal reminded that Ukraine also had support through a four-year IMF program worth 15. 0.6 billion US dollars. Watch this. The economic growth rate often becomes a key indicator for assessing the country's financial state. However, in the conditions of war, this indicator can be biased and not reflected the accurate picture, as stated in an article about the economy of Ukraine in the New York Times. The bias is that military production has increased and needs government fundings. Thus, this production drives the economy. But in regular times, there would not be such a demand for this particular production. However, Ukraine has shown 
other aspects of economic stability. In particular, we can adapt to the various challenges of war. For example, the ability to ensure a stable electri electricity supply, even during Russia's winter campaign against energy infrastructure. Ukraine's ability to export electricity testifies to its reserves and potential, emphasized the New York Times. According to the latest data, Ukraine exported over 110,000 megawatt hours of electricity, a record volume for 2023. This is mainly energy produced at the country's nuclear power plant, indicating a developed infrastructure. All these signs indicate that Ukraine demonstrates stability and resilience in the face of difficulties, which contributes to preserving and restoring its economic stability during the war, writes the New York Times. In the future, Ukraine will face significant challenges, such as reconstruction of destroyed cities, the growth of the government deficit, which continues to increase as a result of the lone war, and problems with the labor force due to the outflow of citizens who leaves due to the war and the mobilization of citizens of working age for service at the front. But with the support of European partners, the USA and other countries of the civilized world, Ukraine will stand. The price of war is measured not by dollar bills or euros, but by the values for which Ukraine is fighting first together to victory and then to a restore and rebuild Ukraine. It's all for today. Thank you for being with us. Please subscribe, comment and share your thoughts. See you soon in a week.